Professor Raphael, it's great to have you here in the living room at the Goldman School of Public Policy. Uh, you are an expert on criminal justice policies in California, in the nation, and actually in other countries as well. And we're going to talk a little bit today about criminal justice system and where we are today and how we've gotten into the situation where actually people on both the left and the right are starting to talk about the need for reform. So it's really an important moment in the history of the criminal justice system in America. How did we get to where we are today? What, what are the stylized facts about incarceration in California or in the United States uh, compared to the rest of the world? Uh, well, there, there are a couple of different stylized facts. To start with, around, say, 1971, 1972, the United States wasn't very different from the rest of the world. We incarcerated people in our prisons at a rate of about 100 per 100,000. And then if you add jails, uh, the people who are in jails, maybe another 50 per so 100,000. So just to be clear, prisons are usually operated by state governments, and that's where people go for longer terms. That's and jails are where you go, and they're usually operated by what, cities and counties? Yes, so, so prisons are where people serve terms if they've been sentenced to a year or more. And there's 50 different state prison systems, one for every state, and then there's a federal system for people who are found violating federal law. And so we actually have 51 separate prison systems in the United States that are guided by 51 separate penal mm -hmm. codes. And then the county jails, there's oh, roughly 3,000 counties in the United States, hold people who are either awaiting trial, who are awaiting arraignment, or if they've been sentenced for a lower level felony or misdemeanor that involves jail time or actually serving a, a sort of short sentence for six months to a year. And the majority of our inmates in the United States are in prisons and then a smaller number of inmates are in, are in local jails. Mm -hmm. So 19, let's go back to the early 1970s. So in, in the early 1970s, and the way we usually express incarceration rates is we, we think of to the number of people that are in prison or the number of people that are jailed per 100,000 uh, state residents or per 100,000 residents in the country to normalize for population growth over time. And what's happened in the United States is we used to have about 100 per 100,000 in uh, the nation's prisons, maybe another 50 or 60 in the nation's jails. And then over about a 30-year period, it ballooned to nearly 500 per 100,000, actually slightly over 500 per 100,000 in prison at the, at the peak in so around 2007, and then another 200 or so, or 250 per 100,000 in jails. Um, this has, has sort of made us the world's leader in incarceration. So we have basically the highest incarceration rate in the world where, you know, many times the, the rate of, uh, of incarceration of most European countries, of all North American countries, of most of Latin America, basically the, every other country in the world. And so that's basically what happened. The, the larger question is why did that happen? So most of what we saw was uh, a series of sentencing reforms that, you know, given the decentralized nature of our criminal justice system, were implemented by state after state after state to, to varying degrees of stringency that emphasized very structured sentencing or what, what sentencing experts call determinate sentencing rather than indeterminate sentencing. So where, judges don't get a chance to decide how long the sentence will be. They pretty much have to decide that if the crime is X, the term is why? Well, that, that's, a, a, that's a little bit different, but, but that's part of what happens. So the, the determinate sentencing means that the judge set, sets a sentence length and then essentially a series of administrative rules involving good time credits and so on and so forth determines actually how much time the person serves. Whereas in, in indeterminate sentencing, the judge would set a minimum sentence and a maximum sentence and then a parole board at the back end would decide when the person was ready to, ready to leave. And so part of one of the things that happened is when all the states moved from indeterminate to determinate sentencing, the, the sentencing that were given out were kind of closer to the maximums and then the parole boards were weakened and were unable to, to sort of um, evaluate the person whether or not they were, they were ready to, to re-enter society. Now why was this done? Was there a sense that there was a crime wave and we just had to somehow stop all the criminal activity and that longer sentences, more determinate sentences would have the, the desired effect of reducing crime? That's part of the story. Um, that indeed in the 1970s, for example, if you read James Q. Wilson wrote a, wrote a very famous book on, on crime, 
that basically argued that essentially we were coddling people who were committing crime and it was at the expense of crime victims and society at large. And what he argued for was just tougher sentencing with an aim of deterring people who were deterrable and incapacitating people who were incorrigible. That, that was sort of the, you know, the, the main message of so that book. So the notion was that rehabilitation really wasn't possible, that the whole point of prison was what's called incapacitation, take, them, take people out of society who might commit crimes, and then they won't commit crimes, and therefore you've solved your problem with respect to criminal activity. Yeah, well, in some ways, the, the kind of dual ideas of deterrence and capacitation are, are sort of what, what drive proponents for stiff sentencing. That, that A, if you have a tough enough sentence, you deter people from committing crime in the first place, then you never have to use the, the sanction. And if you have to use it, then you remove someone from society who's very criminally active. The, the, the issue of rehabilitation actually was sort of a parallel story happening at the same time. There's a very famous uh, literature review, an extensive literature review during the 1970s that concluded that nothing worked in terms of rehabilitating offenders. And it received a lot of attention. It, it sort of uh, crystallized and occurred in conjunction with, with changes in thinking regarding incapacitation and deterrence and a more sort of almost utilitarian interpretation of what sentencing should be doing. Um, and for a while, it, it, uh, it actually impacted policymakers that people had read this, this very famous review and concluded, indeed, rehabilitation was a waste of time. Um, since then, actually, there's been quite a few uh, uh, sort of revisionist uh, assessments of, of that literature and a lot of experimental evidence that suggests actually people do change, people age out of crime. Um, people with cognitive behavioral therapy and things like drug treatment can actually desist. Uh, and you know, so it's, it's no longer what is uh, driving current policy thinking, but in the 70s and 80s was very important. So we now think we could actually maybe solve some of our problems with crime through rehabilitation and different approaches outside of the criminal justice system. What did we get with all this incarceration? I mean, one answer might be, hey, we really reduced crime and that was great for society, so it was worth it. Was it worth it? Uh, well, so th there's I'm a, a large... I'm almost a yes or no on this. Sure, sure. I, I think that, well, it's hard to say. So, so I would say that going to 500 per 100,000, 700 per 100,000 was not worth it. That being said, some of the early increases in crime, say from 100 to 150 or 150 to 200, probably was worth it, right? And the, the, the reason for that equivocal answer is what the research on the relationship between the use of incarceration and crime tends to show is that, that indeed, on average, you incapacitate people. There's not a lot of evidence for strong deterrence of very lengthy sentences, but there is evidence that if you remove somebody who's in a very criminally active portion of their life or is a very criminally active person, that they'll actually, you know, that you're preventing crime in society. However, what we see is that on the margin, that effect tends to diminish quite rapidly. So when you go from 100 to 200, you take a bout out of crime. When you go from 200 to 300, you take less of a bite out of crime. When you go from 300 to 400, you take a very small bite. So you're starting bite. to get the people in prison who, who are not the recurrent offenders, who are not the persons who do the more serious crimes. Is that, is that right? That's so, pretty much the story. And the interesting thing about that is it happens along two sort of dimensions. And in, in, in one sense, you incarcerate people into older age, and age is a very strong predictor of, of offending, even among people who have extensive criminal histories. And then on another sense, you sort of net widen and apply it more liberally to people who, who aren't as dangerous as who would be incarcerated in a very low incarceration mm -hmm. rate setting. So tell us, just give me a little vignette here. So on age, what are we talking about? So criminal activity is concentrated in 18 to 25 year olds, and then by the time you're 30, that's it, just it not what you're gonna to, be doing? Yeah, so it, it tends to peak in the mid, uh, in the early to mid 20s, and then declines quite, uh, quite drastically after that. And you see it among, if you look at people's criminal history records, you see it if you look at uh, sort of inmate misconduct within prison, you mm -hmm. actually see the same pattern. So it's, it's really sort of, you know, crime is kind of a young person's game. Uh, I think it, that's a number of reasons. Young people tend to be more impulsive. Their brains are still developing. There's a lot going on. 
Um, and th there's a, a wide variety, or actually a, a deep sociological research about how sort of key junctures of the life course like marriage and becoming employed and becoming a parent and things like that tends to sort of have people knife off their past and they, they end up sort of desisting from crime and offending at a much lower rate. So part of what was happening is we were starting to put people who let's say were doing a little bit of property crime or something like that, we we're putting them into prison for long periods of time, but the truth is they weren't engaging in that much crime. That, that doesn't mean they don't shouldn't go to jail for a while or to prison, but it maybe means putting them into jail or prison for 20 years is a bad idea because by the time five, 10 years later comes, they wouldn't be doing it anyway. So you're just really wasting your resources. And what kind of resources are we talking about to incarcerate somebody? Uh, well, it depends on the state. Uh, some, some states, the cost is very low. It could be on the order of 15, 16,000 a year. In California, the estimates are between sixty and seventy thousand dollars a year per inmate. Um, most of the difference in you can go to Harvard for that. Yeah, yeah, you, it's, it's expensive. <laughs> most of the difference in cost has to do with labor costs uh, in terms of who's running the prison. And in some states, the labor costs are higher than others. Mm -hmm. The variation in inmate inputs, it tends to be low, although in some instances uh, where the population is aging, you can actually spend quite a bit on, on health care. So people. and then another problem is you've got older inmates in prison who you have to provide health care to. Right. And that right. can become enormously expensive. Right. Also, what happens if you keep people in prison a long time in terms of their return to the community? Does that make it harder for them to return? Yes, de definitely. Uh, when, when you speak to people who have done very, very long sentences, it's amazing how um, you really get a sense as if they're sort of arriving to a completely new world. So they're not sure about how to use a cell phone. They don't understand computers. There, there's a lot of technological advances that happen even in a five, 10 year period that becomes uh, sort of quite alien. And I think for, for many people, that reentry process, especially the first few weeks, feels very perilous. People you know, are, are, are abashed about doing the most simple thing like going out and buying clothes and trying to find a job and a place to live. And so for many, that reentry process is actually a very, very difficult adjustment period, especially if they've been you know, on a sentence or, or coming off a term that's 10 years or more. So we've incarcerated uh, maybe too many people in terms of the benefits we get from that and maybe for too long a period of time. What is going on to try to change this? There's a process in California I know you've been very involved in called realignment. What generally is going on there? So ca California is an interesting story because part of what happened or, or much of what happened in California was not so much deliberate policy reform as uh, reform that, that was prompted by uh, the need to respond to a court order. So there, there are two famous uh, uh, cases of inmates suing the, the state of California alleging that the overcrowding conditions in California's prisons were depriving them of their constitutional right to not have, um, uh, to not be, ha not be subject to cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, tell us, what did that look like? What does what overcrowding look like? Is it people five to a cell, or what, what kinds of well, conditions there, were they experiencing? There, I mean, there are different ways to characterize it. So, you know, the prison facilities are actually character, they have a rated capacity, and so you can judge the population relative to the capacity that they're supposed to hold. At its peak, when California had a, over 170,000 inmates, the prison system was at 200% of rated capacity. And what that meant was, you know, cells that were meant for one person had two people in them or three people in them. Day rooms, instead of being day rooms where there'd be programming, had, you know, triple bunk beds and, and there was just a lot of people in very, very, very small places. When you have a lot of crowding, um, you know, fights are more likely, places lock down more, uh, resources are diverted to maintaining the prison and less for, for programming. The queues for the existing programming that, it, that, that is there becomes longer. Uh, and I think this, the conditions of confinement are much more harsh. You know? So these court cases came to what conclusion? Well, they concluded that, it, that indeed, uh, bo both of the cases actually centered around the healthcare system. One was, was regarding whether or not the state was providing uh, adequate healthcare uh, resources, and the other whether they're providing adequate mental healthcare. And basically, a, a, a three-judge federal panel 
ruled that indeed the overcrowding was the reason why these inmates were not being provided adequate care. It was appealed by the state to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled uh, in favor of this three-judge panel, upheld their finding, and the panel ordered the state to reduce the prison system to 137% of rated capacity. And From that's, 200 down to 137, yeah, so that's a lot of inmates. It was, it it was a lot of inmates. And what, what the state had ended up doing is they passed a, a reform in 2011 that, that basically reduced the ability of, of uh, parole uh, officers to revoke people back to prison for um, violations that didn't involve new felony uh, offenses. That was a very large part of the reform. And then the other part of the reform was people who were convicted for what are called triple non-offenses, non-violent, non-serious, non-sexual offenses, are essentially now punished in the locality. So with probation terms, with split sentences, where they'll do a little time in jail, followed by a probation tail, and uh, are not sent to uh, prison. And so what we saw over a relatively short period of time was that the prison population of the state dropped from about 160. 3,000, something like that, to about 134,000 in the course of about six or seven months. The part of that drop was offset by an increase in county jails of about 8,000. But for the most part, we saw a pretty large decline in the overall number of people so incarcerated. So what did this do to crime? And Very what did this do to the individuals who were then released early or uh, to local jails? Well, what's interesting is you there's, there's very little evidence that had any impact on crime. So there's absolutely you know, no sort of uptick in, in homicide, in sexual assault, in robbery, uh, in aggravated assault, right, and all of the major violent crimes. The one crime where you see a small effect is for motor vehicle theft. So there was a small increase in motor vehicle theft that seems to be you know, on the order of an additional crime per inmate. You, you have a great story about this. It turns out motor vehicle theft is sort of an interesting crime. Yeah, it turns out that it's a high skill crime, right? That, that people who, not, not only in terms of the ability to steal a car, but the ability to move a stolen car. That there, there's not only human capital involved in, in uh, sort of actually, you know, stealing an automobile, but you also have to have the social cop capital to, you know, bring it to a chop shop and have it parted out or have it, have it sold. And so some of the speculation about why perhaps we saw an increase in motor vehicle theft is because people who engage in motor vehicle theft are, are people who specialize in a particular crime and they have something invested in those skills and that was one of the crimes that was actually realigned under, under realignment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how about the people who then uh, get out early or who go to the jails? Is this better for them or I mean you might of course you might say well they're free now that's great but what does that look like for them? Well. Uh, it, it's interesting to contrast it with what was happening in the state before. So, what what people would how people would describe prison was, you know, you'd go for your first term, you're convicted, and you're a new core commitment, and you're sentenced to state prison. You did a year or two or whatever was your sentence plus your good time, and then when you got out, you'd be on parole for three years, five years, and. You, the likelihood of being sent back to prison on a parole violation was very, very high, right, on the order of 60 to 70 percent over a three-year period. And so people would get a parole violation, they'd go back to prison, stay there three months on average, four months, be returned, you know, be out for a few months, be sent back on parole violation, and so on and so forth. And basically there was a lot of in and out and in and out and in and out, what people call doing life on the installment plan, right, that people were kind of cycling in and out on these parole violations. And these parole violations were what? being caught with a weapon, well, that, committing that, another crime. What's, what's interesting about that, so at the time, before realignment, there was the claim that actually a lot of those parole violations were crimes that, uh, that could have been prosecuted. The local district attorneys were essentially default, you know, refusing, not refusing, but declining to prosecute, and then it defaults to the board of, of parole hearings that would then revoke the person back to prison. So it was kind of a way to fast track someone who they could have prosecuted and convicted. That what we saw after realignment was that, that you don't see a big increase in conviction rates. So, so the arrest rates of these, of these guys when they get out of prison are roughly the same 
the conviction rate went up just a little bit, and that conviction, the increase in the conviction rate was entirely driven by a, a higher likelihood that now if you're arrested, you'll actually be prosecuted. But we don't see, you know, if it were the case that all those parole violations were actual crimes, we would have seen a big increase in conviction rates, and it didn't happen. There was another recent reform in 2014 that is, we, no one has quite studied what the effects were, but it, it, in late 2014, the voters passed Proposition 47, which basically redefined a series of lower level felony offenses as misdemeanor offenses. And that actually led to a fairly sizable decline in both the prison and jail populations on the order of six or 7,000 people, at least what we know so far. The effects on public safety, we don't know what the effect is as of yet, but it's definitely kind of scaled back so, you know, as of today, California's incarceration rate is below what it was before three strikes. So we're back to 1991, 1990 levels. And at least after realignment, our crime did not rise back to what it was in 1990. It was still what it was in 2014, which is much lower than it was in 1990. So in general, we have much less incarceration and not no real appreciable change So we're change spending in less rate. on incarcerating people and getting no more crime than we had in the past, and therefore that sounds like a net good, big time. Yeah, the, the spending is a little bit complicated because uh, sometimes it's, it's not necessarily the case that you can have a marginal reduction in a population and a, a consequent reduction in spending because it depends on staffing and it also is sort of wrapped up in the capital of the system and so on and so forth. But if, in order to comply, say, with that federal court order, we either had to build enough prisons to bring the so, capacity ratio to 137, or we had to bring the population. So the you know the counterfactual spending path, we've definitely saved so we've a saved lot of money. Some money. Yes. So the the, yeah. the increase in the rate of spending on corrections has has gone down, which is good, uh, presumably in terms of the taxpayer's dollar. Uh, let me turn to another thing. You're also working very hard with the Attorney General Kamala Harris to have statistics and data online so that people can be aware of what's going on. Can you say a little bit about what you're trying to do there? Sure. So, so this is an effort uh, by, by Attorney General Harris uh, under the, the moniker of the Open Justice uh, uh, Data Program that basically is making uh, data maintained by the Attorney General's office more publicly available to, to you know, Californians and to researchers more generally. And to date, They've posted micro-level information on deaths in custody, the deaths that occur in the process of arrest, deaths occurring in jails, deaths occurring in prisons. Is, these are things that have made the national news yeah. in some places. Yeah. In essence, I think California's kind of on the cutting edge here. So the, there are very few states that have done this. There, there are a couple of, um, there are a couple of crowdsource web pages, and and then the Washington Post also has an has an effort where they're basically, uh, you know, getting people to 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 submit reports and then they have someone verify the report by checking it with the media of a death that occurs in the process of arrest. But there are very few states that actually post, you know, everything that's been reported centrally to the Bureau, you know, to the Department of Justice regarding deaths in custody. So I see a bottom line here in terms of public policy analysis that we're getting to a point where we're using data a lot more to try to figure out what works and what doesn't work and making sure that we're spending taxpayers' dollars in the most efficient and effective way. I also see that we're using data to try to inform everyone, citizens, about what's going on in the criminal justice system so that we can identify problems and try to solve those problems. Is, is that about right, the two major areas you think that's yeah. going on? Well, in crimin I think that's happening across many policy domains, right? So in the Department of, you know, in the realm of health and human services or anti-poverty or labor markets, that's always been the case. I think in criminology that's also been the case and in criminal justice policy. The one difference I would say is in criminal justice policy the data needs are often very immediate. So, so a lot of the infrastructure is geared towards servicing the information needs of the officer in the field or servicing the information needs of the person writing up a, a pre-sentencing report or, or, a, or a prosecutor deciding whether to charge someone or not charge someone. But now increasingly you have many researchers that are teaming up with corrections departments, with attorney generals, with the federal government to actually analyze all of those uh, large, huge uh, 
um, administrative records databases to try to understand relationships, what works, what doesn't work, and to try to provide an evidence base for practices. So actually, I think you've identified a third area. So there's this policy analysis to figure out what works and what doesn't work. There's the transparency so that the citizens know what's going on in the criminal justice system. The third thing you said was just using data to make the criminal justice system work more effectively and efficiently. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's quite a trio of things, and I think in the end, would hopefully lead to a better criminal justice system. Are you optimistic about the future? Do you think we're, we're really on the right path to making sure this system works better and that we don't have some of the awful things we sometimes see on the nightly news? Um, I, I do think we are, yes. I, I also think that the interesting thing about the information infrastructure criminal justice is given that it's needed on a day-to-day -day basis, it's hard to just shut things down and, and kind of reform. Everything has to happen in an evolutionary manner. and you know, and there, there are gaps, right? So there are still police departments that will write tickets by hand, right? And you know, where people are typing things on typewriters. I don't think that's true in California. There's but lots it's of police departments, there, cities, counties, townships. There's almost, I think there's un, slightly under 20,000 different, you know, uh, local state police departments in this country. Yes, yeah, so there are many. The, the truth is that the criminal justice system is all about not not entirely, but in a large degree, is sort of a poverty issue, right? That that it it bear you know it has a disproportionate impact on on poor people, both in terms of victimization as well as in terms of enforcement, and that a lot of the problems that officers encounter, or that prisons encounter, or jails encounter, are the problems that the extremely poor face, right? So homelessness, substance abuse, mental health, you know. Uh, prior victimization, prior trauma, and so on and so forth, that all comes to the fore, and that's everything that's behind, you know, problematic arrests or, or you know, many things that, that you're reading about in the nightly news. And the, the world is kind of moving in that direction of linking across these systems and trying to understand this phenomena better with an idea of, of trying to, you so, know. So you see hopes for a more oh, humane yeah. and effective criminal justice system. Great. Well, thank you, Steve Raphael, professor in the Goldman School of Public Policy. Thanks for telling us what's going on in criminal justice in California and in the nation. Thank you for having thank me. You.